So welcome everybody. My name is Ed Friedman. I chair Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. Thanks so much for coming. Um, appreciate that. Um, this is, I think, our 25th uh, year of having a speaker series, and we do this uh, uh, October through May on the second Wednesday of each month. And we are a unique organization here in that um, we do what it says here on the screen, research, advocacy, land conservation, education. So we take a holistic look at uh, the environment and we're very unusual in that respect. A lot of our research is cutting edge. Uh, we generally ensure that it informs our advocacy, which can also be um, harder edged than the average bear. Um, so, uh, you know, we've done some work on lights, uh, the, the hazards from lighting, certainly a lot of work on the hazards from uh, electromagnetic fields, radiation, radio frequency radiation, and we'll deal with those issues tonight. See archaeology on here. We just um, located the second oldest uh, or the, the second prehistoric wooden fishing weir in the state, which is pretty cool. And get our newsletter, you'll read more about that. So advocacy um, tonight is an educational uh, presentation on some of our advocacy. A lot of our work revolves around fish passage, getting migratory fish past hydroelectric dams on the river. We have an active education program for years. This is where we have had a kind of crimp in our style from COVID, but uh, the speaker series is part of the program as well. It's not just about kids. And we were able to get into a couple of schools outside a couple of schools this fall and had a fantastic uh, live theater program involving the kids about pollinators, pollination. We are a land trust and we have uh, protected this point, well over 1,500 acres of land, most significant uh, large parcels around the, the bay, uh, protected the most significant prehistoric archaeological site in the state, and we have three conservation easements in process. If you miss this talk or have colleagues who missed the talk tonight, uh, we do record these and usually takes a couple of days and we get them up on our website. And this is our home page here. Scroll down the right side under education, you'll see a a link there to speaker series uh, video list. And what you'll get is a copy of the press release and down at the bottom of it is a, uh, a YouTube link to the show. So we are most, uh, our speaker tonight, uh, was graduated from Harvard in 2005. He obtained a law degree from UC Berkeley School of Law in 2011 and uh, practiced at the California law firm of Briscoe, Ivester and Basil before moving to New Orleans and, find, and founding his own shop William Most and Associates. Um, he's licensed to practice in Louisiana and California, and maybe by the time he's done with us, we'll take his main bar. Um, uh, William has re represented individuals, businesses, nonprofits, municipalities, state agencies, regional planning groups, uh, California tribes, activists, journalists, artists, students, prisoners, farmers, tenants, developers, family trusts, private landowners, and utilities, boo. And, uh, <laughs> and, and how about animals, William? So uh, anyway, I've never represented an animal. He, he has experience. Uh, you're sort of you're sort of representing nature now, which is a growing field as well. So we appreciate that. Um, William has experience in trial and appellate courts. Sits on several advisory boards, including the National Policy Accountability Project. Um, and I know a lot of his work revolves around uh, the incarcerated now. Um, he's been an editor of the Climate Change Law and Policy Reporter, member of the San Francisco Urban Forestry Council, and a court-appointed special advocate for foster youth. William holds a certificate of specialization in environmental law, and prior to becoming a lawyer, uh, William was a fisheries biologist and worked for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and so worked with our former DMR uh, commissioner. Um, so... Uh, William was selected to the 2020 and 2021 Louisiana Rising Stars lists published by Thomson Reuters. And um, thank you for being here, William. I also want to, I also want to, am I still on? Hello? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I also want to thank Martha for, for being behind the scenes here, Martha Spies on the Zoom uh, tech stuff, Peace Action Maine for helping us with the program. Martin McDonough for uh, making sure our website works with all this stuff. And a special thanks tonight to Scott McFarlane. I haven't looked to see if Scott's on the call, but 
Scott's a member of ours who um, is a PhD graduate from Columbia, but when he was a Bowdoin College undergrad, it's very special in that he wrote a paper and had it published in the journals, peer-reviewed journals, called Defining a Nuisance. And that was about the history of uh, pollution and economics and politics on the Androscoggin River. Well, thank you, Ed, and, and thank you, Martha. Um, I really appreciate y'all's time to be able to talk to everyone here today. Um, as Ed mentioned, I, I am a lawyer and I'm based in New Orleans, but I have a lot of fondness for Maine and I'm currently litigating two cases up there, which we'll talk a little bit about at least one of them. Um, so I, I appreciate your time. Um, the topic today is the, the law of nuisance, right? Um, and nuisance is a term we use sometimes in everyday life. If we think someone is being a nuisance, maybe in our personal lives, there's there's people who we might find to be nuisances, um, but we're really talking about the legal term here. And, and I'll start with this question, uh, and we'll come back to it at the end of this talk. But the thing to keep in mind, I think partly, uh, and we'll explain why it's relevant, but are these towers here uh, with these flashing lights that flash 60 times a minute uh, in Maine, are they a nuisance? And so th that's something I'd like for you all to keep in the back of your mind as we talk about what the legal framework of a nuisance is and how it actually impacts people in Maine. So what is a nuisance? Uh, it's, it's not just anything that bothers you. It's a legally specific term. It's a term for something that causes injury to another in a legally actionable way, and it usually involves property. So most traditionally, it involves one person's use of their land interfering with someone else's use of their own land. So you think, for example, uh, I've got here at the bottom, on one hand, you've got a, t a tire fire, right? And on the other hand, you've got a cafe. And if, if you're a cafe owner and your next door neighbor starts a, a huge tire fire, you'd probably think that's a nuisance and you might have a legal basis to say so. Um, and and loose, nuisance is not just saying that something is a nuisance, but it gives you the ability to go to court and sue the person who has created the nuisance to try and get them to stop and for compensation. So it's essentially, it's a legal tool that allows someone to go to court and say, this other person's use of their property is wrongfully interfering with my use of my property and it should stop. And what I think is really interesting about nuisance law is that it's really, really old. Um, so it's the first, the earliest mentions we have of it are in uh, very early books uh, compiling legal doctrines. The earliest uh, record of it I could find was from 1187, which is an incredibly long time ago. Um, you know, it, it comes from a time where we probably wouldn't even recognize the language, even though it was English at the time. But yet there's a consistent legal principle that's carried for almost 900 years, uh, which is this idea of a nuisance. The, the term itself comes from uh, the medieval, I, I'm going to guess how to pronounce this. Your guess is as, probably as good as mine. Uh, I would guess nocumentum, uh, which meant loss, uh, damage, or detriment. And that, that was Latin. And it came to our English usage by way of the French word nuisson. Um, and so you can see where we get nuisance from there. Um, and, and it's really just astonishing that we have this consistent legal principle that has lasted for so long. So even back in the 1200s, the assize of nuisance was a legal principle that allowed someone to redress the interference that someone else was causing to the use and enjoyment of their land. And I mean, law changes like everything else, right? Technology changes, language changes, um, the law changes too. You know, you think about our constitution dates back to the, the 1700s. Our, our um, you know, parts of our constitution are much more common, like the, the actual legal framework that allows you to sue for constitutional violations wasn't put into place until after the Civil War in the late 1800s. And so, and yet you've got this legal principle of nuisance, which goes back almost a millennia, um, which blows me away. 
there's probably it's probably the only legal principle I use, except maybe the existence of lawyers themselves that dates back that far as far as I know. So when you're trying to think about a nuisance, I mean, not everything is a nuisance, right? Um, you know, not everything your neighbor does that bothers you is necessarily legally actionable, it's something you can sue them over. Um, and I think a great way of, of thinking about nuisances and a good conceptual framework for it is that it matters a lot about where something is, how it's being used, the context is really important. And so a famous quote from a US Supreme Court case is uh, a nuisance may be merely a right thing in the wrong place, like a pig in the parlor instead of the barnyard. And this is great because I think it, it encapsulates a couple of things about the idea of a nuisance. First of all, that it doesn't necessarily have to be a fundamentally evil thing, right? So, you know, a concert hall is not a good or a bad thing, but if it's right next to an, you know, an old folks home and it's causing a lot of noise, that might be a problem. And so it, it's not to say that music is bad, it just might be in the wrong place for it. Um, so the context matters a lot. And it's also important that the thing doesn't have to be wrong or illegal uh, in order for it to be a nuisance. Something can be a perfectly good and important thing that needs to be done and yet still be a nuisance if it's in the wrong place. Um, what is also, I think, really interesting, particularly for Friends of Mary Beating Bay, is that, that nuisance law is the predecessor to what we now think of as environmental law. So back in 1187, you didn't have the, you know, the, the EPA, you didn't have uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, you didn't have any of these agencies, right? You didn't have the Clean Water Act, you didn't have uh, any of these sort of modern environmental laws, but nuisance law itself serves some of that purpose, right? So um, it, it, it was one of the early principles that allowed people to push back against the harmful use of land or, or damage to the environment. Um, and a common Latin principle that's often used in this context is sic utere tuo ut elenium non latus, um, which is often shortened to sic utere, which is the idea of use your property in a, in a way that doesn't injure other people's property or injure their use of their property. And so that's, I mean, that's, you know, very common to, that's a common principle to a lot of modern environmental law, right? The Clean Water Act. Don't use your property in a way that you're dumping harmful chemicals into navigable waterways, right? Um, or the Clean Air Act. Don't use your property in such a way that you are pumping harmful chemicals into the atmosphere. And these ideas were, uh, the, the groundwork was laid by nuisance law. But nuisance law didn't go away. So it wasn't replaced by modern environmental law. It's that environmental law sort of sprung out of it and nuisance continues to be an active principle in, in modern American law. So I'll give you a concrete example of how uh, nuisance law was a predecessor to modern environmental law, which is the obstruction of fish passages. So nuisance law was applied many times over the centuries to remedy the wrongful obstruction of, of fish passageways and streams and, and rivers. So an example is in 1806 in England, um, a court, a judge declared that a stone weir was a public nuisance because it blocked the passage of fish, presumably had to be removed. And so whoever was the plaintiff in that case was able to use this legal principle in order to stop this environmental harm before probably anyone had the idea of the word environmental law probably wasn't in anyone's mind in 1806. Um, this even goes back to the Magna Carta itself, which had a provision in it requiring that fish weirs be removed from the Thames, the Medway, and throughout the whole of England, except on the seacoast. So this idea that there's a legal principle by which citizens can vindicate their rights to not be harmed by someone else's use of property it has got a really ancient lineage. 
And of course, American uh, law largely derives from the law of England, uh, with the sole exception of Louisiana, where I am, where it came more from uh, the continent. Uh, but so all, all this stuff is very relevant to American law today. Also, something I'd like to point out is that, um, you know, when people think about nuisance law, it may not, they may not always think about light or light impacts. Um, you know, going back to those two towers I, I pointed out to you, which we'll talk about, you know, the flashing lights are a big part of the problem there. Um, and there's a very ancient and historical lineage for nuisance law being used in the context of light. So um, one of the, the very leading cases that was cited commonly in the pre-American Revolutionary War era about nuisance was what's called Wil William Aldred's case in 1611. And in that case, uh, one landowner sued another for erecting a hogsty near their house. And the impacts that, that this case involved was that the sty was, was blocking the light and also causing air impact. So, you know, nuisance isn't just about someone dumping toxic stuff on your property. It can also be about light impacts as well. So anyone who tries to tell you nuisance isn't about light, uh, probably hasn't read William Aldred's case from the 16th century or the 16, 1600s. Um, so so what, what's the status of nuisance law today? So nuisance is a legal doctrine in common law, which means it's part of the, the sort of heritage of legal principles that we've derived from the cases going back to England but it's also literally written into state law. So for example, Maine has a law of nuisance in its revised statutes. If you go to revised statute uh, chapter 17, section 2701, you can read it. You can read about it. what Maine defines to be a, a nuisance under its state law, which is any person injured in his comfort, property, or the enjoyment of his estate by common and public or private nuisance may maintain against the offender a civil action for his damages unless otherwise specially provided. So there's, there's a couple things in here, right? Which is uh, anyone can sue for, for nuisance. Now, there are some legal principles that cabin that in. Um, not literally anyone can sue for any nuisance, but anyone who's affected by a nuisance in, in particular ways has the right to sue. Um, and they can bring a case in court. That's the, may maintain a civil action. And for damages, that means you can, um, you can sue for money. So if you've been harmed, you can sue for compensation. And then the second bullet point here is, is another thing that you can get out of a lawsuit. Uh, which is in, in section 2702, talks about not only can you get damages and costs, but you also can get the court to order that the nuisance be abated or removed. So you can actually get an order to get the thing stopped, which you know, for some people may be crucially important because you know, a person's home may be important to them and there might not be a specific amount of money that really remedies them not being able to enjoy their home. And uh, so it's important often for the, to actually get a court order stopping something. You can also see this is where we get modern law of zoning as well. So not only environmental law came out of nuisance to a large extent, but also modern zoning law. Um, you can, you know, the idea of nuisance, which is that some uses of property shouldn't be near other uses and, and negatively impact them is the, is the principle behind zoning. And so that pig, uh, the pig in the parlor quote we read earlier actually comes from Village of Euclid, which was maybe not the first, but sort of the early big case uh, in the US Supreme Court authorizing zoning. Um, and so, Maine's law of nuisance, it, it gives some specific examples, right? Because nuisance itself, just like a harmful use of property, it's pretty generic. So Maine's law gives some examples. Um, 
the erection, continuance, or use of a building or place for the exercise of a trade or manufacture that by noxious exhalations, so like, you know, chemicals in the air, offensive smells, or other annoyances becomes injurious and dangerous to the health, comfort, or property of individuals or the public. Um, and the key in the cases to determining whether something is a nuisance is whether it's unreasonable in interference. So the, the courts look at um, sort of the, the use of property that is being accused of being a nuisance. They look at the uses of property that it's affecting. And, and there's you know sort of a complicated thought process that goes into figuring out what's unreasonable. And in some of these laws that we've just looked at, uh, it talks about a public or a private nuisance. And the law sort of divides those into two things, right? So the law considers there to be a private nuisance, which is essentially your use of your land is specifically hurting my use of my land. And so I want to get to stop. That's a private nuisance lawsuit. So if, if you're suing your neighbor for, you know, dumping all their trash on your lawn, that might be a trespass. It also could be a nuisance, right? Their use of their property is specifically affecting your use of yours. A public nuisance is a little bit different. A public nuisance means it's, it's not just that you're affecting my property. What you're doing with your land is affecting everybody. It's affecting the public in general. That's a public nuisance that can be sued for. Uh, but generally, in order to be the kind of person who can be the plaintiff in that suit, i.e. the person who is standing to bring that suit, you have to have some argument that you're being harmed more than the average person, more than everybody else, that there's something specifically specific about you that you're, you've got a, a harm of an extra degree rather than everybody else. Maybe you're very close to it, or maybe you have particular sensitivities that are causing harm. Uh, to you from whatever the person's use of property is. And you can see it's, it's from this idea of a public nuisance that we get a lot of environmental law, right? So the idea of, you know, a factory uh, going back, you know, having noxious exhalations, right? You can draw a straight line between that and the idea of public nuisance and the Clean Air Act, right? It's just a, a you can, a clear logical connection between those. And what, the, what a lot of the modern environmental statutes do is create an, a, you know, a government infrastructure that makes it so that you don't just have a lot of lawsuits between individuals uh, that's doing the work of environmental law, but actually has sort of a, a coherent administrative framework, which nuisance law does not do. Uh, and, and so it's an innovation of, of modern law that we have that. So uh, some of you might be wondering, why is a New Orleans lawyer talking to you about Maine's law of nuisance? Um, if I could open a window and show you how warm it is outside, it's definitely not as cold as Maine, right? I'm not physically in Maine. So, so why am I talking to you about Maine's law, towers in Maine? Um, it's because of a case I'm doing. It, it's the case of Friends of Mary Meeting Bay versus Central Maine Power Company. Um, so this is a, a lawsuit that I am currently rep involved in representing a group of plaintiffs. So Friends of Mary Meeting Bay itself is one of the, the plaintiffs. And then there are three individual landowners that are also plaintiffs in the case. The case is against Central Maine Power Company, uh, which is probably an entity I don't have to explain to any of you what it is. Uh, I'm sure you're all more familiar than I am. And it's about the, these two towers at, at the Chops Passageway, which is um, where Bath and Woolwich come together. There's a, a passageway of water between them. And power lines go over that passageway supported by these two towers. And you can see them here in the picture. Um, they now have flashing lights on them. They didn't used to. Uh, but this is what we're looking at. And so as background, I mean, there, there have been towers at these jobs passage for, for many years, for decades. There were 195 foot powers 
towers that supported the power lines across the Chops Passage. Um, and then in 2018, uh, CMP replaced those towers with slightly higher towers, towers that are 23% 23, 23 taller. So it's not like there's new towers. There always were towers. These are a little bit taller. And here's a, here's a diagram of them. And you can see the passageway down the middle. Um, and, but the, the thing that's really different that, that in part generates this lawsuit is that CMP added flashing lights to these towers. So the old towers, I mean, they were 195 feet tall. They were painted red and white to make them visible to planes. There never were any problems with uh, air traffic. And this is not an area with um, super high air traffic. It's not super close to any airports. It's not really a common area where airplanes fly through. And you know, during the course of the 80 years that those towers were there, was more air traffic than there is in the modern era. Uh, air traffic in the area has declined, but even back in the heyday of, of more planes, there, there never were any problems. The towers were always totally visible. But CMP uh, spent quite a bit of money to add a system of 10 lights to the towers that flash 60 times per minute when they're active, which is not what the FAA recommends. The, the FAA recommendation that we found is 30 times a minute. So this is 200% of the uh, recommended speed for flashing lights. And these lights are really, really, really powerful. So, um, you know, based on the information that we've got, they are visible over an area of approximately 4,000 square miles. So you can see them from a really long way away. They impact the view shed uh, of this area, quite a lot of it. And, um, and they're operated by a radar system too. So originally the, the lights were set up to be flashing all the time, 24 seven. Um, that was modified and a radar installation was installed and it's what's called an active radar system. So it is always sweeping an area of about 2,400 square miles with, with radar. And the lights stay off until the radar system detects an aircraft and then the lights come on. The problem being that it, it doesn't, it's not just triggered by, uh, by aircraft, it also can be triggered by weather patterns and all sorts of stuff. And so these lights do wind up being on a significant amount of time. And, I mean, I'm telling you this, but probably many of you in this in this presentation have seen them. Um, I would guess. I, I think there are real problems with the way these lights were set up. There were no public hearings held prior to the installation of the lights, as far as we know. CMP didn't disclose the lights in its application to the Department of Environmental Protection about the, the rebuilding of these towers. Flashing lights like this are explicitly forbidden by the City of Woolwich's uh, municipal code. And then the other tower sits within the city of Bath's natural resource preservation overlay district, uh, which restricts um, uses that can be used for that kind of property. So there's a lot of procedural problems with the way these lights were placed. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I've said this specifically, but this lawsuit is about, it's, it's saying that these lights are a nuisance, that CMP's use of its property on these towers on this land is, is a nuisance to the community and the environment in the region because it causes impacts. I mean, this is an area that is, is, is fairly dark sky. You know, there's not tons of lights at night as y'all know better than I do. Um, and so having these very high intensity flashing lights installed really changes the, the area. Um, and so there's a range of impacts that you can imagine from these lights. So wildlife impacts, right? Um, this area is home to the Northern Long-Eared Bat, which is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. It's also home to a, a number of bald eagles, which are protected under uh, one of America's oldest environmental statutes, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, 
and they're also protected under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, there are harms to local property owners. So th three of the plaintiffs in the case are people who live in the area and have impacts, the lights shining into their home, um, causing trouble with sleeping, trouble enjoying the property. Um, you know, when there's ice, the, these lights re reflect off the ice and, and the light is magnified or, or the impact of it is magnified to a certain extent. So, you know, local property owners are feeling harms from this, including potentially reduction of property values. Because when these people bought these properties, there weren't giant flashing lights in the neighborhood. And FOMB is an, it's an environmental advocacy and education group, but it's also a property owner. It owns, as Ed mentioned, it owns conservation easements, which, um, which are property rights and uh, requiring that certain areas be maintained in a, in a more natural environment. And, and that is a property right, just as owning a home is a property right. A conservation easement is a property right. And so FOMB is, in that sense, a property owner in the area as well. And there's all sorts of other impacts. So the FAA, which did an analysis here, did find impact highly likely to air defense and homeland security from the radar system. So here's the lights. Here's, uh, here's one image of the lights at night. Um, you know, you can see that this is really a, a, a pristine dark area in many ways. And these lights, when they're flashing, really substantially change the, the, um, the character. And you can see the lights up top and then them reflected off, off the water. Um, these are also, this is a, a map of surveyed eagle nests in the area. So you can see that there's quite a lot in the region. And so this is, this is an area with, with real environmental concerns. And I think it's really important to know that um, in this lawsuit, our clients are not you know, opposed to air safety, right? CMP has tried to strenuously argue that, that these lights are absolutely mandatory for air safety and that perhaps the plaintiffs, you know, are trying to undermine air safety. That's been an insinuation. That's just not the case. So it's not that, um, so FOMB very significantly cares about air safety. Ed Friedman um, is, is a pilot himself, so cares very personally about air safety. And so FOMB has, has come up with alternatives. So um, came up with five suggestions for alternative safety measures that, F, that CMP could implement that would achieve the safety goals without having the flashing light impacts. So that includes marking the towers with paint, like painting them perhaps red and white. And that's what worked before, right? Um, it's not clear why that wouldn't work now. Uh, there could also be added marking balls, so large, um, you see sometimes white and yellow balls that are added to the power lines themselves to make them more visible, because the power lines are kind of the hardest thing to see. Um, issuing a notice to airmen, which would be an indication, advanced notice that these towers, the location of where they are, and the, um, the potential issue. Also, an alternative to there's also a couple of alternatives to the radar system. So currently what CMP has set up is a, a very expensive uh, active radar system that is, is, is sweeping the area with uh, active radar, but there's alternatives to that as well. So there's, the, there's a system called the passive aircraft detection system. And just as, as radar sort of like sweeps the area trying to find airplanes, a passive system uses Nat, you know, already existing uh, radio signals to sort of echolocate for planes. And so it has the same function, but rather than sending out uh, radar, it listens to what's already existing. You can kind of, the way I conceive of it, at least, is the difference when, you know, in an old submarine movie, the difference between, you know, sending out sonar pings versus listening and using the, the existing sounds to figure out where something is located. And it's worked in many places, a passive aircraft system. Or alternatively, 
there could be a pilot controlled lighting system. And the way that would work is, I mean, if the concern is that, yeah, pilots know where these towers are, but maybe they'll get lost at night um, and not know where the towers are. There's a system that allows um, pilots to click their, their transceiver and the lights will come on. And so that, that would mitigate, you know, maybe a pilot gets lost, is way off course. They could still have a way to, to light up these towers, see where they are, but it wouldn't be an active system and it wouldn't be flashing all the time. And so the, the idea behind this case is essentially that there should be, uh, you know, a, an alternative way of, of achieving air safety that does not have the impacts to the wildlife, to property values, to people's enjoyment of their property, uh, et cetera, that CMP's lights and radar system have caused. That's the idea behind the case. The case is ongoing. Um, so the current status of the lawsuit is that we brought, we brought the case in court. Um, the trial court judge, the first judge to, to assess it, um, wound up agreeing with CMP's arguments for why the claims should be dismissed. So CMP has been vigorously defending the case, and they, they asked the trial court judge to dismiss the case on the idea of federal preemption. The idea being that, that federal law being involved in this area means that this case should be thrown out. And the primary federal involvement here was that the FAA issued what are called no hazard determinations, saying that, yeah, if you have these towers with these lights, it's not going to be a hazard to air safety. But even the FAA's no hazard determination, number one, didn't say this is the only way you can make it safe. And number two specifically says, I mean, it's on the piece of paper, says that it does not relieve CMP of state law compliance. So we appealed that decision to the Maine Law Court, the highest court in Maine. And last October, we had oral arguments in front of the, the Maine Law Court, explained to the court why we don't think this case should be thrown out, why we think it should proceed to determine whether or not this um, these towers as currently constituted are a nuisance to the community. So that's the current status of the case. And so I, I think a question, uh, and I would love, you know, I, I appreciate any questions you all may have, but I would also love to hear so any input you all have about whether you think these towers are a nuisance or not a nuisance. And I think, you know, you may have arguments one way or the other, and I'd be very curious to hear people's thoughts in addition to, to people's question, because fundamentally, you know, we're trying to figure out, are these flashing lights and radar system, are they a pig in the parlor, right? Are they maybe an okay thing in general, but in the wrong place? and not necessary? Um, are there alternatives? Are they an unreasonable interference with other people's uh, property and, and the environment? Or are they okay and should continue flashing um, for as long as the towers are there? So that's, that's the question. I would love to hear any questions you all have or, or take any thoughts. So William, this is Ed. If I could just add a couple of things. Please. Um, the, that first of all the towers are if you're flying that low you're flying illegally anyway so they are below the limits of navigable airspace for, so people should know that if they're going to make a call on nuisance or not um, as you sort of alluded there are radio frequency radiation impacts from the radar that was not the focus of our appeal because that at least before the current environmental health trust FCC case was a little less subject to, or more subject to preemption, which way uh, the, the FAA guidelines are just that. The lighting and marking guidelines are advisories. They don't have an enforcement or, or, or real weight to them. So that's why our appeal went that way. Um, <laughs> Ed, can I ask a question? This is Bob Goldman. Hi, Bob. Sure. Hi there. Uh, what what was in it for CMP to do this? Like, is this a tax write off? Why do, why would they spend this money, and then install this radar? I can't imagine it's totally cheap to do this. 
where where the, it clearly isn't necessary. There's less traffic. It's illegal to fly that. Yeah. Well, near the, that. So so, what, so what, what happened, Bob, was that the um, when your when your when your potential obstruction goes higher than 200 feet, you're required to notify the FAA. Okay. And then you can come to them and say, this is what, you know, if necessary, this is what I propose, you know, paint the towers, uh, put the balls up, whatever, uh, you know, if, if that's necessary in this location and at this height, none of those are necessary, but they didn't go to the FAA and say that. So they just said, we will do what's in the guidelines. And so the FAA said, okay, now, uh, because of about a year's worth of people getting on their case about these really obnoxious lights flashing all the time, they, to, to use a phrase that William came up with, which is really good, and, and I wish you'd said it, William, they, they, ameliorate, they attempted to ameliorate one nuisance with another. So they, you know, without a necessity, put the radar system on Yes, it killed the lights for a lot of the time, but as many of you know, I know we're on the call, everyone here is now getting, you know, exposed to radio frequency radiation at about nine gigahertz frequency. Um, and, you know, for many people believe that's a, you know, it's without a doubt, it's a biologically active substance and it certainly, uh, some people are more affected than others, but everyone probably is affected as are the wildlife. So that's, an important part of the picture as well. And that we just learned not too long ago was a $2 million uh, cost to CMP. So that gets to the issue of public utilities kind of spending as much as they can or want to because that's how they make their money based on a percentage of expenditures. Yeah, th this is why, this is what I was getting at. Is there like a financial incentive for them to spend money like this to yeah. to kind of waste it there is they you know they receive a, a rate of return a profit margin when they make capital investments so to the extent that you know they can make a, a large capital investment like this light and radar system they they receive a return on that so yes that could be a motivation for uh making you know maybe investments or spending money in the name of safety that isn't actually required for safety there could be a profit motive behind it mm -hmm. thank you um, I... okay. colleen is next oh, thank you uh, yeah i just wanted to you guys to know the lights have been on they're on now and they've been on for like 15 to 20 minutes non-stop um there's been no airplane that I've seen go overhead. There's no lights from airplanes or anything. I'm looking, they're right off here to my, the lights are right off to my left. Um, the, it's kind of, it's almost a joke now when those lights go off, especially at night, we know or even, even during the day, it's, it's because it's either geese or eagles and there are no planes. I mean, it is so rare. And maybe once every 200 times the lights go off, there might be an airplane in the air, but it's mostly those lights indicate to us that there's a flock of geese coming in. That It's ridiculous. It's stupid. It's really stupid. But it, at this time of year, when the, when the bay freezes over, um, and during the times of the year when the, the, um, the sandbars out there, the grasses on the sandbar are really low and the tide covers it over. So there's no interruption in the water from Bath all the way to the Topson Bank here. Those, when those lights shine, it's like almost two miles from my house to those lights. Those, both of those lights just stream right across to my house. That length of that, um, those lights, just pound right into right into my house. It's not just light, it's a lot of light reflecting into the house. Um, and it's extremely annoying. I mean, beyond annoying. It's like, you can't even look, you, I can't even look out this side of my house when, it, when that's happening in under those conditions. That sounds like two votes for nuisance to me. Um, and of course, you know, we asked CMP to turn the lights on for this presentation to make sure everyone 
knew could look out and see that. I'm just kidding. Oh, you did? No. <laughs> just oh, okay. No, no, no. No, uh, no, but it was certainly courteous of them to turn the lights on while we're talking about it to uh, make sure everyone knows what we're talking about. Well, they're, they're still on. I mean, how many geese and eagles could there possibly be? I mean, there's no planes. There's something wrong with those lights right now because there's not that many geese out there flying around. Yeah. Not in these temps. <laughs> and uh, Laura asked the question in the chat, um, is CMP owned beneficially by a Spanish or European en entity? Uh, yes. The, so CMP is now uh, foreign owned. It, it's 85% owned by this the Spanish energy company Iberdrola SA. Um, so yes, this is a, a largely foreign owned corporation that we're talking about. It has a, it's the parent company has a business presence in about 24 states across the US. <clears throat> Excuse me, can that get you any more leverage in court? You've got a foreign entity that's impacting local residents where it's operating. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a formal legal doctrine that ma makes them more sort of on the hook for it. We're, we're actually suing CMP. We're not suing the parent company itself. Um, but look, I, I think that, you know, th there are optics here, right? And uh, right. The, the, the questions of how attuned is a company going to be to the needs of the local community, given that it's mostly owned by people far, far away is, is a good question, right? Um, and Nuisance is fundamentally a legal principle that as a community, we get to decide what's the right way to use our land. Um, and so, although, you know, it doesn't, whether or not the defendant is foreign owned or not, is not really an element of the nuisance analysis. I think it sort of ties to some of the ideas behind nuisance about, you know, this is a community decision about how we want to, to you know, manage the different uses in this area. So I, I think it's a good point. Thank you. Um, Greg asks, has Chop Point School or any gr other groups joined the lawsuit? Not currently. Um, the current plaintiffs in the case are Friends of Mary Meeting Bay and then three private landowners. Um, so it, it, Chop Point School is not currently a, a, a plaintiff in it. And, and Greg, uh, I can address that further. Um, the, one reason may be why, well, one reason the towers are where they are and we're having the problem is Chop Point School in that the old towers were, the old tower on the Woolwich side was located right in the thick of the Chop Point School infrastructure. And when the time came to replace the towers, which were supposedly pretty rusty, um, Chop Point asked CMP to, when they're gonna replace it, move the towers uh, the tower back out of the, the busy school zone, which is which I totally understand. In order to do that, the towers had to move up the hill and further away. And so they had to become higher to maintain the span across the chops passage. So but but the the, 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 the impetus for moving them was that was was Chop Point School asking them to. And these are the effects of that uh, that move. Right. So it's, you got a little bit of a, if you give a mouse a cookie sort of scenario here where, you know, the, the towers were moved not that far, but that meant they were a little bit upland, which mean they were a little bit higher, which meant that, you know, the, the, it was higher on either side, which meant that they installed these lights. And then because of the lights, they installed the radar system. And so what started out as, you know, I completely agree with Ed, a, a totally, you know, reasonable desire, right, to, to have it be a little bit further from the school. Uh, you know, you move several steps down and you result in these giant flashing, 10 flashing lights flashing 60 times a minute when they're on uh, with a process that didn't allow for community engagement and input. Um, and so when you don't have those opportunities for community engagement, when you don't have public hearings, when you don't have um, the involvement of the zoning code of these, of these cities, that's when you get these these impacts that people may not have known were coming and then all of a sudden they're there and they didn't have an opportunity for input. There was a period of, of trying to negotiate and trying to work with CMP to find a better way to do this, to implement the alternatives. Um, you know, no one, look, I, I am a lawyer. I sue people for a living. That's what I do. But I'm always working to try and avoid that because a lawsuit is not always the best way to solve problems. 
it, it was only really when these plaintiffs tried to work with CMP and were completely rebuffed. CMP told them they had no choice but to do these lights, which is inaccurate. Um, it was only after they were completely rebuffed and the alternative was rejected and CMP saying they didn't have any discretion whatsoever that the lawsuit was the necessary and final step in, in trying to work it out. A question, I, I don't see other people stacked up here, Williams, but I, I know there are people listening on the call that have strong interest in the environment and fish passage. And I know there are people that have strong interest in wireless proliferation and radio frequency radiation. And, you know, could you maybe speak to applicability of nuisance law in, in those areas and in general, how maybe more specific laws might um, occupy the space that nuisance law once did, making nuisance law a not very viable um, cure in some situations? Yeah, so it's a good question. So nuisance law is, is a state law, right? It's, um, you know, it's part of the common law we got from England. It, it's part of state law. As we saw, it's written into to main um, statutes. And then you've got the federal laws, the big federal environmental laws and, and various federal laws. And so the argument that CMP is making is that because of the existence of these federal laws, the state law can't have anything to say about this. So that the state law is preempted from getting involved in, in regulating these towers. Um, and I, I think that there's some real concerns about where that argument could go. So the, the no hazard determination that CMP is, is hanging its hat on as the, the sort of impact point of federal law is a, is a document that it's, at its heart is a recommendation. It's not an order by the FAA to the CMP to do anything. And if just federal recommendations completely crowd out any state law involvement, then you've got a real problem. As we point out in our brief, um, you know, the, the CDC makes recommendations uh, to wash your hands, but that doesn't mean that state health laws are somehow crowded out. Um, the National Highways Transportation Safety Administration recommends you wear a seatbelt. That doesn't mean that state speed limits are off the table. Uh, and you know, just because NOAA recommends certain things, that doesn't mean that states can't control recreational and commercial fishing in their state waters. So. Um, you know, I, I think it's a pretty radical argument that that CMP ha, is making in court, and uh, we were disappointed that it got some traction at the trial court level. But you know, we're very hopeful that the the main law court will will recognize it for what it is, which would be a pretty big shift in the way federal preemption works. So um, the hope is, you know, the the law court gets it right. We go back down to the trial court. We get to make our arguments do our investigation, do discovery, make our arguments for why these towers are a nuisance. Because the way things currently are, um, if CMP's argument prevails with about preemption, we don't even get to the point of saying whether it is or is not a nuisance. We don't even get that far. So I, I'm very hopeful that we will get to the question of whether it's a nuisance, these towers are a nuisance, because I think that's an important question. Any other questions about uh, this case, the law of nuisance generally, um, where these towers are situated, anything like this? Um, we've got a question uh, from Jarda. We negotiated with, about an incinerator, about flashing lights on the grounds of health impact to people with disabilities, especially seizure episodes. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good point, right? Um, and, and we have heard that, that these lights um, caused or triggered seizures in at least one person. So. Um, I think that's a really good point is that flashing lights, I mean, it's called the law of nuisance, right? Uh, but we're not just talking about annoyance. As Colleen pointed out, this is more than annoyance. This is, this is a real tangible impact that has tangible impacts to people's health, safety, uh, environmental impacts. So the law of nuisance is not the law of annoyance. It's the law of harmful and unreasonable impact. So I think that's exactly right. Laura raised, Laura raised a property value issue, and uh, we did talk to an appraiser about this at some length and did a lot of research on this. And, uh, you know, it's the, the, the appraisals go both ways, uh, opinions go both ways on the effects of lighting. And certainly with COVID, 
you know, people are jumping to live in rural Maine. And if they're coming here from New York City or Los Angeles or Santa Monica or New Orleans, where they're used to seeing lights everywhere, it's like, wow, two towers with lights, you know, you know, I'm in heaven, you know, so a, a lot of that is relative, I think. Yeah. When does the, um, wh when can we expect a decision from the appeal court? We don't know. They don't have a specific time limit to issue their ruling. You know, it's been uh, a little more than two, about two months since oral argument. Um, so I don't know. You know, it's sometimes judges can be very unpredictable. Sometimes, you know, you can wait a long time for an opinion. Sometimes it happens right away. I think the fact that, you know, it, we still don't have it yet, I, I take as a good sign. They're thinking it through, you know, they're working through the issues. Um, you know, there were arguments on both sides. And so I think, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that it has taken some time, but I'm hopeful that that's a good sign. Um, yeah, Nancy asked, was there no requirement that CMP hold public hearings? Um, I mean, as we get further into this case, we may argue that there were such requirements that they just violated those requirements. Um, and I think they are, will argue or would argue that the federal preemption means that they don't have to have any hearings uh, because they don't have to follow state law uh, if, if there's federal preemption. So to the extent that this case moves forward, that'll certainly be an argument we make. Before, before, before we go, do you want to articulate your, your main argument there from the oral arguments, uh, William, about <laughs> my main argument? Um, I don't recall exactly what I led off with, but I, I mean, I, I think my, the idea of enforcement that there is no, uh, that there is no enforcement of the FAA advisories without state law, yeah. right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, the these, um, I think, you know, the more I thought about it and the more I researched, the more I think CMP's argument completely aside from nuisance, right? And, and the harms that their argument could cause sort of to the law of nuisance and, and state law. I think there's also real harm it could cause to the way the, the federal Aviation Act is set up, which does have this system for the FAA making recommendations about air safety to, you know, what kind of safety mechanisms are necessary for certain kinds of towers. And the way it's set up is that they issue these sort of recommendation documents, which are um, called the no hazard determinations. And if CMP had its way that these recommendation documents eliminate state law then you are left with a scenario where really no one can enforce uh, these kind of air safety measures because the FAA can't enforce them because they've only got the authority to make recommendations and states can't enforce safety measures because under CMP's theory, they'd be preempted out. And so create this sort of glaring loophole by which, I mean, I guess would be depending on the good graces of big corporations like CMP, to uh, abide by recommendations about air safety. And I personally, I'm not willing to take that bet. Um, and I, I doubt many of the people in this room are. So it's a really good point. I, I will say that we tried to get the FAA to do conduct an environmental review and they brushed us off by saying that these are advisories only and they don't do environmental reviews for advisories. So they sort of emphasized that. Uh, Laura, we'll wrap up with Laura here. You've got a question here. Uh, let's see. If Laura's question is, if the Maine Supreme Court affirms the lower court decision, does this preclude filing a federal lawsuit uh, over the same issues with the pending state claim? Uh, it seems that the lower court totally missed the boat and it's ruling since air safety is not at the court of the case. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you about the lower court, in my opinion, getting it wrong. Um, and you know, I think it's a complicated question whether this would preclude a, a federal lawsuit, but it's something that could be discussed. But um, look, I agree with you, and and I'm hopeful that you know, judges are people too, right? And um, sometimes they get it right, in my opinion, and sometimes they get it wrong, in my opinion. But thankfully, we've got a system where there's multiple layers of review uh, in the court system, so you know, th there's more people that are going to take a look at this, and I, I feel really privileged and lucky to represent um, such great, courageous advocates. So thank you very much 
to Ed, thank you to Colleen, thank you um, to, to FOMB, to everyone here for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it.